Right. Good evening. I need some volunteers to help with cards. Cooper needs some help up here. Uh, you thought when well, some of you fellas want to pick up cards tonight? Well, here comes a couple more. All right. It's good to see everybody tonight. Just a few announcements, and uh, we'll be ready to get going here. Uh, we're hosting the summer youth series this week. Um, that'll be Tuesday night. We'll meet here at the building. Have several uh, congregations coming. We'll probably have somewhere around 200 folks here uh, Tuesday night. And uh, like uh, Eli said this morning, uh, whether you have little ones or not, if you can come, I would highly recommend it. The singing at these things is always absolutely wonderful. And uh, we'd love to have you come if you can. Uh, also, uh, we need some help with desserts. We've got the meal covered, but uh, if you can come and bring a dessert for Tuesday night, that would be much appreciated. Uh, as well. Next week will be our Vacation Bible School. We'll start next Monday, uh, the 11th, and uh, we'll go through the 13th with VBS, and then on Thursday, the 14th, we're going to have our family fun night uh, like we normally do, and so we're really looking forward to that. Uh, the, if there's any of our teachers that still haven't picked up your material yet, I've got that up here on the front pew, and really would like to get that to you tonight uh, before you leave. Uh, also, uh, please keep in mind, as most of you know, uh, we'll have snacks each night for the kids, so we'll need folks to be bringing 
uh, those items in, uh, as, especially as we get closer to time next week. I understand we ran out of the cards that we passed out this morning. I apologize for that. I'm going to call it tomorrow, uh, make sure I get some more ordered. Hopefully we'll have some more by Wednesday night. Uh, if not, we'll have some by Sunday at the latest. So uh, there's still plenty of time uh, for you to, to get one of those and fill that out. We have a number of things planned uh, to do with those cards. So uh, we'll, we'll be sure to get some more of those in uh, and have those. That's a good problem to have to start running out of things so we're, we're happy about that and we'll get we'll make sure we get some more uh, make sure everybody gets one who wants one uh, as soon as possible uh, regarding our prayer list uh, as we mentioned this morning we want to remember all of those on our prayer list but especially wanted to make mention of Tammy Doyle uh, if you will remember her she's recovering at Jackson Madison County Hospital uh, and also we mentioned this morning Hunter Orman uh, Hunter and Donna Ari, his mother, have been visiting uh, quite a bit here lately, and um, Hunter has COVID. He found out Friday this week he has COVID, uh, and uh, Donna's at home with him, and, and so please remember them in your prayers uh, as well this week. All right, fellas, y'all go ahead. All right, I think that's all. Oh, pregame, young folks, don't forget about pregame Wednesday night as well. That'll be at 5.30. Tonight our opening prayer will be led by Trent Capps. Craig Medlin will be leading us in our singing, and uh, I will lead our closing prayer at appropriate time. Let's all join in together as we pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, tonight we come to you thanking you for all the blessings that you give us. Thank you for the good things in our lives, the simple things. We'd like to thank you for the ministers here at the Greenville Church of Christ. We'd like to thank you for the elders and the deacons, for the teachers, for all the church members that make up this good, good place and good family. Tonight, Father, there are many of those that are in need of our prayers, many, many, and we ask that you comfort them and bring their health back. Forgive us when we do wrong. Help us to go about this worship in a way that's pleasing in your sight, and forgive us of all of our sins. Help us to be more like you. Christ and with Christ. Amen. Number 77. Number 77. Hey, well, Jesus, I can say.
afternoon, evening, everybody. It's great to see you all here again. Uh, I really loved Ernst's lesson this morning, us diving into uh, what evangelism looks like. You know, last week we spent time diving into how each and every one of us can do evangelism as individuals, but uh, we were at a breakneck pace last week, and so I really appreciate Brent uh, starting to dive in at maybe the slower pace where we can kind of slowly walk our way into the deep end instead of just diving in and hoping for the best. So I really do appreciate that, and it's super helpful. And, and just getting to come here tonight and focus again on God and His Word is fantastic. Uh, so it's my least favorite time uh, of the month again when I get up here and tell you how undisciplined I've been going to the gym. Uh, again, uh, tonight we're focusing in on some of our spiritual disciplines, and we talk about this, and I always equate it to us going to the gym. You know, at the beginning of the year, me, Jenna, and a handful of our friends committed ourselves to this 75 hard challenge, two workouts in the gym a day, 75 days in a row, and I made it maybe two weeks. Uh, and just want you to know we're going strong on our streak. Uh, been paying for the gym for about four months and have not seen the gym any single day within those four months. So fantastic job by me. But we look at these things and we look at, say, maybe the time that we spend in the gym or, or maybe the time that our kids in sports spend at the weight room or at practice. Or, hey, we have musicians in our home, the, the amount of time they spend at the piano or with the guitar. And we look at these things and we say, this is fantastic, this is awesome, because what they're doing is dedicating themselves to making them better at whatever skill or, or game or whatever they're deciding to do. You know, someone dedicates three hours a day at the gym, five days a week, and we're like, that's awesome, they're trying to improve their health, they're trying to make themselves better. Hey, our kid is spending three hours a day uh, during the summer with the football team, learning how to play his role, learning what it means to be a part of a team. That's awesome. And we see that these things are important. But when it comes to our spiritual lives, a lot of the times we look at, at the things that we're supposed to be doing, and we don't see them as training tools. We see them as maybe part of a checklist that we don't want to do. We see it as the end goal and not something that we're supposed to be training with every single day. And we've looked at some of the more uh, common things when we talk about these spiritual disciplines. We've talked about the act of Bible study, actually diving into Scripture and trying to figure out God's plan for our lives, trying to figure out maybe where some people pursuing God went right and went wrong and how we can emulate that, how we can look more like Jesus, and actually diving into Scripture and figuring out how God wants us to live our lives. We've talked about this idea of being disciplined about our prayer, that, hey, when we go to God in prayer, it's about modeling and having a conversation with Him. Talking to God is just like talking with your husband, wife, uh, parents, kids. It's supposed to be this thing that's super beneficial to our relationship, helps us come to a mutual understanding, but a lot of times we treat prayer as just this thing that we do at worship or before meals. And that's, yes, that's a great time to do those things, but that's not what prayer is limited to, and we don't practice prayer. And we've talked about coming to church to worship and how, you know, being disciplined in our actually coming to worship and focusing in on what God is, what he has done for us, how that affects and changes our relationship with him and makes us stronger in our walk and pursuit of God and of Jesus. And as I was kind of going through the books that I've been studying on the spiritual disciplines, as I've been going through the scripture, diving into what it means to be disciplined in these things. There was only one book that mentioned it, but with the seminar we had last week and with kind of the, the new change in culture uh, that we're having with our congregation, I decided to, hey, let's skip ahead three or four chapters and dive into this one book and what this means. And what we're talking about tonight is, of course, sticking with our same theme of evangelism. Now, this is not something that I would have thought as a spiritual discipline. I thought I'm going to be completely honest. Uh, evangelism is one of these things that I thought our spiritual disciplines would be training us for, not a spiritual discipline in and of itself. But as I dove into this book, I actually saw that this is something that is training us to be more like Jesus, something that does get us closer to God, help us attain that personal relationship. And, and so I wanted to dive into this tonight. 
So like I said, we, we always focus in on training, whether it be going to the gym, whether it be sending our kids to practice every day so that they can get better at whatever they're trying to do so that we can get stronger in whatever we're trying to do. And as we're focusing in on evangelism, I want us to think of it as the same thing. You know, we are coming here, we are going out into the community, and yes, we want to be successful stewards of God's Word. We want to be able to be able to spread the gospel to anyone. But for us to get better in that, for us to train in that, for us to become disciplined in that, sometimes we might make mistakes, sometimes it might be hard, sometimes it might be difficult. And that's what I want us to focus in tonight. Because when we go to the gym, uh, I'm sorry, I'm... A uh, buck ninety, uh, and I have worked out maybe a total of three, three weeks in my life, like consistently. I'm sorry, I'm not going to put two plates on each side of the barbell and just be able to rep it out. Like that's not something that's going to happen. I would fail immediately with that. And a lot of times in our training, we're called to repeat things until failure because it makes us stronger. It makes us better. When we look at this idea of evangelism, when we look at this idea of spreading the word of God, that fear of failure is oftentimes, oftentimes what keeps us from pursuing evangelism to begin with. Now when it comes to other things, failure it is appreciated, it, it's applauded because that failure makes you better. Hey, when you're told on your third set to go to failure, you actually go to failure because guess what, you may feel weak for the next day or two, that muscle group may feel terrible, but guess what? When you come back to work that muscle group the next week, the next month, you'll see the growth in that muscle group. Whenever you're playing a song and, and you're struggling with one section uh, of the music, a, a certain bar or a certain whatever it is, you slow it down, you so start working on it more and more until it eventually becomes something you can play, and, and maybe even the strongest part of the song that you're playing. And we applaud those failures because it helps strengthen maybe our weak points in where we play music and, and makes us a better musician. And so when we come to this idea of evangelism, I don't want this idea of a fear of failure to be what scares you away. This idea of going to someone and presenting a message and them not liking it, them not receiving it, and them walking away. Guys, that, that's part of it. That's part of the spiritual discipline. Just like you may not be good and consistent about your prayer life. You may not be focused when you come to worship. You may not have a good study habit. But guess what? When we come and realize those failures and realize, hey, this is what's messing me up and that, it makes us better. And it can be the same with our evangelism. Whether it's a method that's messing us up and making us ineffective, we can learn, we can grow from that. Or sometimes people just aren't receptive to the Word. Uh, an example that I want us to look at for this, and we aren't going to turn in Scripture, but I think it's a story the majority of us know, it, is Jesus interacting with the rich young ruler. Jesus has this person come to him. He's excited. He's zealous to strive after God, to follow him, to be one of Jesus' right-hand men. And, and Jesus says, okay, I'm excited for you to do this. There's just one thing that I need you to do. I need you to sell your possessions, and then you can come follow me. Sell your possessions, and then you can come follow me. And Jesus, all the message that he preached, all the message that had gotten to this man that made him want to pursue God, this one message from Jesus caused the man to turn away, and we don't know if he came back or not. We're not told if he came back or not. But I'll tell you what, I don't think Jesus was happy that this guy walked away. But would any of us ever consider Jesus a failure in evangelism? I think we're selling ourselves short when we say that just because one person doesn't look to, uh, listen to us, that one person doesn't listen to us, that one person walks away because of what we have to say, that we're a failure in evangelism. I say, let's look at Jesus. He did everything right. He got the message across, and he just wasn't receptive. One person not listening to you, that fear of failure shouldn't drive you away from practicing evangelism. There's a verse that I want us to turn to in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 really quick, and this is just a verse we'll hit on super quickly before we get into the meat of this lesson. So 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. Now this is a verse we probably all know the first half of. This is a verse we turn to a lot. But ye are an elect race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That's awesome. We turn to that verse and we say, okay, we were chosen by God. The church is a special group of people. The church is chosen by God to be his special people to usher in a new age. We're chosen. God appreciates and has a special relationship with us. That's fantastic. We use that verse as an encouragement all the time, but what we don't focus in on is the second half of the verse. Why do we have this special relationship with God? Why has God chosen us as his own nation? That ye may show, for, uh, that ye may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let me read that again. That ye may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're supposed to, because we're these special people, because we have this special relationship with God, we are supposed to be showing people in darkness the God who has called us into light. We're chosen as God's special people. We have this special relationship because it is our mission and our goal to spread that light to everyone, to spread the message of God to everyone. And when I was looking at this verse, it kind of came into mind for me. Uh, I started thinking about the president. Uh, I don't know why, but it's what came to mind. Uh, when we look at the president, uh, his life is kind of made for him. Uh, he gets to live in a house that's fully staffed. It's cleaned every day. He doesn't have to cook. He doesn't have to worry about his food. He just has to say, hey, this is what I want. Please feed me. Simple enough. He doesn't have any of the normal everyday stuff to worry about, whether, hey, is the water bill paid? Hey, am I taking care of X, Y, and Z? Hey, I've got to run to the grocery store. No, those things are taken off of his plate, so they're, they're not worries for him. But it's all because of, of something more important. You see, the president doesn't have to worry about those everyday things anymore. We took those off of his plate so that he can serve a greater purpose, so that he can lead us, so that he can usher in uh, policies that will be great for us, hopefully great for the world. And we're in the same boat as Christians. God chose us to have this special relationship with. God chose us to be his nation. God gave us everything that we need, which is a relationship with him. But he didn't give it to us just to give it to us. Yes, he wanted that relationship with us, so he gave it to us for that reason. But he gave us that relationship in order that we might serve a greater purpose. And that purpose is what we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we may show the excellencies of, excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into light. We're given everything we need through our relationship with God so that we can serve a greater purpose of spreading that light to more people. You see, this fear that we have about, hey, what if I turn someone away? Hey, what if I, I'm in the middle of an awkward situation? Hey, what if I kind of mungle up this relationship that I have? Guys, that might be what we consider a failure in evangelism, but guess what? We can learn from that, and we're called to pursue that. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult, we're called to practice it, and we're given everything that we need to practice it. So to actually turn to and figure out what this spiritual discipline of uh, evangelism looks like, I want us to turn over to John chapter 9. John chapter 9 is where we're going to be based out of tonight, and we're going to walk through this story together. So John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And as he passed by, he saw a man blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, Neither did this man sin nor his parents, uh, but that the works of God should be made that the works of God should be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. When I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoke, he spat on the ground and made uh, clay of the spittle and anointed his eyes with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is interpreted sent. He went away therefore and washed and came seeing. The neighbors therefore 
uh, uh, the neighbors therefore, and they that saw him aforetime, uh, that he was a beggar, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Others said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He said, I am he. They said therefore unto him, How then were, th were thine eyes opened? He answered, The man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to Shalom and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. And they said unto him, Where is he? He saith, I know not. So what we see here is a story of a blind man, one of our go-to stories within our children's Bible classes. Uh, this man had been blind since birth. Since birth. That was a weird way that that came out of my mouth. Uh, had been blind since birth. Uh, hadn't been able to see his entire life. So his parents had provided for him. They had taken care of him. And, and eventually, for whatever reason, whether his parents passed or whether they gave up the responsibility, uh, this man was left on the street to beg. Uh, this is how this man survived. He sat uh, on a corner, and, and people would bring him coin. People would bring him food. People would take care of him. Simple enough. And so Jesus and the apostles are walking by walking past this man, and the apostles ask a question, which I don't want to focus in on tonight, but Jesus says he was made blind so that the power of God could be shown through him. And so Jesus does what he does. He goes, spits in the dirt, makes a little bit of clay, a little bit of mud, puts it on the man's eyes, and says, hey, get up, go to the pool of Shalom, and you will be uh, washing it, and you will be able to see. And we see this man do exactly that. Uh, he gets up, he goes to the pool of Shalom, washes off, and lo and behold, he can see. That's not where the story ends. We see this man get up and go back to his hometown, go back to his village, and as he's walking around doing his thing, uh, the people in the village are like, that guy looks really, really familiar. That guy, I'm not sure who he is. And, and with a few people, it starts to click. Hey, is that the guy that's been sitting on the corner for forever? Is that the guy who wasn't able to see just yesterday? Hey, what, what's going on? And eventually it starts to click. Hey, some people are starting to think, hey, this is the guy who is blind. And the town sort of becomes divided of people who say, this is the guy who is blind, this isn't. And eventually the guy hears all the talk about it, and he says, yes, I am the blind guy. Now, I want us to put ourselves in the shoe of this man who had been blind since birth, who had had his community taken care of. Now, I've never been in this situation, thankfully. And hopefully none of you guys have either. I don't, I don't know everyone's situation here. But from what I hear, when you have to go to someone for help, it's not a comfortable thing. It's not a comfortable conversation to have. It's not the most comfortable relationship to have. And that's the exact relationship that this man had had with his town for however many years he had been alive. This man is surrounded by people who, when we think about that social ladder, he would have said, I'm at the bottom of this thing. Everyone is at least 10 rungs above me. This guy in the social situation that he was in, he would have said, okay, I am the least of these. I have no idea what's going on. I don't really think I should be speaking up right now. I think I should let these people talk. This guy was in a not-so-fun situation. From where he was sitting, the power dynamics would have been way out of his favor. And so when the people start talking about him, start trying to figure out what's going on, this guy likely did not want to speak up. He was in a situation where he felt like he was probably the loser, felt like the walls were coming in on him, and he was getting all this attention that he did not want. But eventually the, the walls caved in enough, and this guy said, hey, I am here. I have to tell you guys what happened. And he said, Jesus healed me. And we don't see a full conversation. We just get two or three lines back and forth between the town and these people. But we see that this man in a social situation where he probably felt like he was at the bottom of the rung, where he pro probably felt awkward speaking out, where he likely wouldn't have said anything had the walls and the pressure not started coming in, this man speaks out and starts telling the truth of what happened. He says, guys, I was sitting on my corner like I normally do, and someone came up 
who's a voice I didn't really recognize, someone who I hadn't really met before. I, I recognize most of your voices. You've been taking care of me for years. Uh, but this guy came up, he put mud on my eyes, said, go wash in this river, uh, and then you'll be able to see. And I did exactly that. And then when I came back, I, I, I heard people talking. I figured out, hey, it's this Jesus guy who's been preaching and healing and teaching people all over the nation of Israel. If he's able to do this, if he's able to save me from blindness that I've had since birth, something's probably up. This guy's probably what he's claiming to be. We're able to see this man who was probably in an awkward situation where he felt like the power dynamics were way out of his hand, way in favor of everyone else, in a situation where he didn't want to speak. We see him immediately speak up and tell them the truth about the guy who had come to heal him. Probably in a situation where most of us have never found ourselves and in a situation where we would feel the most awkward we've ever felt, the most scared we've ever felt in a social situation. This guy spoke up. And it's not the only time that we see it. Continuing in John chapter 9, verse 13. They bring to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And again, therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. And he said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some therefore, the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath. But others said, uh, How can a man that is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They say, therefore, unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, in that he opened thine eyes? He, and he said, he is a prophet. The Jews therefore did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of him that had received the sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now seeth we know not, or who opened his eyes, we know not. Ask him, he is of age, he shall speak for himself. All right, we'll come back to the scripture here in a second. But yet again, we see this man who is at the bottom of the totem pole socially, at least in his eyes. You know, he had been a beggar for years, subsisting off the, the, the wages and the niceness of the community around him. And so he's already in this awkward social situation where he feels like he owes these people everything. He should just slink back into the background and not be the center of attention. But guess what? He's already been put into the center of that, this awkward situation for him, and he felt, okay, I can go ahead and tell the gospel of Christ. I can tell what happened to me. And these people who have been taking care of this man for years are like, okay, we don't know what's up. We have no idea what's happening. Uh, we are super confused. And so what do you do when you're confused? You go to someone who's supposed to know a little bit more than you. And so these people say, okay, this is obviously some kind of miraculous thing. So we're going to go to the people who should know about miracles. We're going to go to the religious authority. And so they go and get the Pharisees who, who are uh, over their town, over the religious things at this point in time. And so they take the blind man forward. And the Pharisees are like, okay, we, okay, tell us what's going on. And so the community comes and tells the Pharisees, hey, uh, this guy has been blind since he was born, uh, and now he can see. We don't know what happened to you do with him. And so the Pharisees are like, okay, this is kind of a weird situation, so let's figure it out. And so the Pharisees get together with this blind man, and they say, okay, what happened? So it was the Sabbath, you were sitting on the corner, uh, this Jesus guy came up and rubbed dirt on your eyes, told you to go wash in this river. You washed in this river, and you gained sight. And the guy who was blind said, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And so let's look at this social situation again. Not only is this guy in an awkward social situation within his community, where he feels like he's the least of these, where he feels like he shouldn't be speaking out, where he feels like he shouldn't be the center of attention, and he's thrust into that. And he goes and tells the gospel of Christ, a situation where he shouldn't be speaking up at all. And then his community, not knowing what to do, takes it up one more notch. 
Instead of just being the focus of his community, he's the focus of the leaders of the church. Which, I'm not a part of Jewish culture. I wasn't a part of Jewish culture 2,000 years ago, but I can tell you that that is probably the most intimidating situation that that man could have found himself in short of being in front of Caesar. This man would not have known what to do. But this guy in, in a situation where he's surrounded by people who are intimidating, in a situation where he doesn't know what could happen because he was healed on the Sabbath, he walked a certain distance, which you're only supposed to walk so far from your house on the Sabbath, this guy could have received punishment. This guy could have been killed by these Pharisees. It's very likely something that could have happened. But this guy in this situation, knowing the very little that he knew, the only things that he knew of Jesus were probably the rumors he heard around town and the fact that Jesus healed him. He said, okay, I'm going to tell you what I know. This Jesus guy who we've been hearing about performing miracles, healing people, teaching people all over the nation of Israel, came up, took a few seconds, gave me instructions, and when I followed them, I was healed. Jesus healed me on the Sabbath. And so there's a little bit more questioning, and the Pharisees eventually come to the idea that we don't trust this blind man just inherently. We have to figure out if he was really blind from the beginning or if he was just a plant. And so what they do is they go find this man's parents and they bring them in. And so this guy's parents are sitting before the Pharisees, probably the most intimidating situation that they've ever been in, surrounded by a council of religious leaders, and what do they do? The religious leaders come and say, hey, is this your son? Was he blind? And if so, how was he healed? And so these parents of this blind man, who I would assume are very happy that their son is healed, that he can start doing things on his own, having his own life, are intimidated. They don't want to have anything to do with this. And so they answer the questions that they know won't get them in trouble. Yes, this is our son. Yes, he was blind. And then the Pharisees follow that up with, okay, well, how was he healed? Obviously, he's your son, so you got to know, like, hey, he didn't have those eyes, like, a day ago. What happened? And they're like, we don't know. He's a man. He can answer for himself. We don't want anything to do with this. We answered your question. Please just let us go. You see, in this situation where the parents were likely made known, of what had happened to their son, made known of how their son was healed, they backed down in the face of something uncomfortable. They backed down when they felt intimidated. And they stepped away. Let's come back to the story. Uh, John chapter 9, verse 22. These things said his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man should confess him to be the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. So they called a second time the man that was blind and said unto him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He therefore answered, Whether he is a sinner, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Let's back up just a little bit. When we start reading in verse 22 again, we find out that the Pharisees, this council of men, this council of religious leaders, said, okay, let's figure this out. We don't know how he was healed. We don't want to admit that Jesus healed him. So what we're going to do is if someone comes in here and says Jesus performed the healing, that, hey, Jesus is this powerful Son of God, Savior that he's claiming to be, we're going to disfellowship him, we're going to excommunicate him. He's not going to have a part of the synagogue anymore. He's not going to be a part of our church. He's not going to be a part of our community anymore. And so the parents answering the questions that they answered said, okay, we'll step out. And so the Pharisees pushed them aside, and they brought the once blind man back in again. 
And from the way the Scripture reads, I think it's relatively understood that this former blind man knew that, hey, if I keep testifying that this Jesus guy came and healed me, that I'm not going to be a part of this synagogue. I'm not going to be a part of this Jewish custom anymore. I think that's relatively understood with the situation that's going on. And so the, the Pharisees bring him back in. Again, you have to remember, super intimidating. Not a fun place to be for this guy. They bring him in and they say, this Jesus guy that healed you, we believe that he's a sinner. And we don't think sinners can perform healing like this. And this blind man likely only having been healed for, I would guess, like at most two or three days, at most. He gets up and he testifies in front of this council of men. I don't know if he's a sinner, but what I do know is that he has the power he claims to have. He healed me. This man who had been blind, who had been living off of the niceness of his community, had been living off of people taking pity for him, not only faced his community, who would, he would have felt so much lower than, would have felt that he had no reason to speak among them, spoke to his community. This man who had been living off of the pity of his community for forever got called into a council of some of the most powerful men in Israel. Having only known really about Jesus for at most a handful of days and said, this Jesus guy healed me. I believe in his power. I believe he's claiming to be the Son of God. And if he's claiming to be that, I believe him. Let's continue on. Verse 26. They said therefore unto him, what, uh, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I told you even now, and ye did not hear. Wherefore, wherefore would ye hear it again? Would ye also become his disciples? And they reviled him, and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken unto Moses, but as for this man, we know not whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is the marvel, that ye know not whence he is, and yet he opened mine eyes. We know that God heareth not sinner, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and do his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, it was never heard that any one opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then the Pharisees answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. This man, who had known Jesus, for again, at most, a handful of days, knew the power of Jesus for at the most a handful of days, spoke out against the religious leaders of his time. Spoke out against a council of men who had probably the most power within the nation of Israel. They could have put him to death for blasphemy. They could have... Uh, disfellowshipped him from the Jewish community. And this guy, who was the lowest of low within their community, said, I've got this. I'm going to tell them the truth. This man was not afraid to tell the people of Israel, to tell his community, to tell his friends and family, to even tell the people who were questioning what happened to him the truth. And this was the guy that had been sitting on the corner begging for food since the day that he was born. And if we look at some other examples within Scripture, this isn't something that's entirely rare. You can turn over to John chapter 5. 
and we read about the story of the man who sat at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. 38 years this man sat waiting at the pool of Bethesda for healing. And as soon as he got it, he did what Jesus said. He picked up his bedroll and he started walking home. And as he's walking home with the bedroll, it's a Sabbath. He's not supposed to be carrying that. The Pharisees stop him and say, hey, what's going on? You're breaking the Sabbath. And this man that had been waiting 38 years and just experienced Jesus minutes, maybe an hour ago, says, this Jesus guy healed me. Same situation been sitting on a street corner, living off the pity of others for decades. And he's not afraid to tell people about Jesus. Now, I understand that our situation is a little bit different from theirs. In some positive ways for them, but also in some positive ways for us. You see, we see the power of Jesus. We do. We see it uh, through our redemption that we can find through his blood. But guess what? We don't experience the same healing that they did. If I had not been able to walk for 38 years and some dude comes over and tells me, hey, get up and go home, and I'm able to do that, guess what? I'm going to be pretty convicted right then and there. But guess what? We still see God's power and we still understand. But here are the positives for us. You see, these people, like we read in John chapter 5 and John chapter 9, like I said, this blind man probably knew the power of Jesus for a handful of days at the most. That man who got up his bedroll and walked away from the pool, he knew Jesus maybe for a handful of hours, and that's if we're being generous. These people were at the bottom of their rungs socially. We're not there, guys. We have influence. We have relationship. We don't merely know Jesus for a handful of days or maybe an hour. We've known Jesus for a long time. And guess what? If they can do it, we surely can. Guys, I, I, I don't remember when Rob mentioned this specifically, but uh, in one of his lessons, he was talking about how he came to this idea of being an evangelist. And he uh, mentioned the fact that in his preaching training school, we were trained a lot to, to work with the church. But we don't talk a lot within those training schools about reaching the lost. I know at Faulkner we didn't. I'm not sure if Brent, how often y'all actually talked about it. But I think there's a reason we don't emphasize that as much. And I think it's because it's an understood fact that if you're willing to go to preaching training school, if you're here in the pews three times a week whenever the doors are open, it's because you know enough. If you know what you need to know to get in that baptistry and be baptized and become one with Christ, you know enough. If these two men that were healed just days ago know enough to tell the story of Jesus, admit his claim uh, to being the Son of God is true, you know enough to go and talk to your best friend, your cousin, your co-worker about Jesus. And guys, I'm going to be completely honest. When you look at these examples of people who are being surrounded by councils of the most powerful men within Israel, it kind of takes my fear of failure about evangelism away. Yes, I might have an awkward relationship with someone for a handful of weeks. Yes, I might say it in a way that drives people away. But guess what? These two people, the, the, the blind man and the man at the pool in Bethesda, they had an awkward relationship with these Pharisees. These are people that they probably wouldn't normally talk to, and that didn't scare them off. Their fear of failure of these Pharisees not listening, well, guess what? Those Pharisees didn't listen to them. But it didn't scare them off. Our fear of failure doesn't scare us off 
from failing in sports. It doesn't scare us off from failing in any music performance. It doesn't scare us off from any failure on the ball field or at work. Why do we allow that failure to scare us when it comes to the mission field? That failure is just opportunity for you to grow, for you to learn, and for you to become more like this blind man. Someone who is loud and proud about what they know about Jesus, even in the face of fear. Even if you think you might have an awkward relationship, an awkward few conversations, I don't think our fear is anywhere close to the fear that this man felt. So why, if it wouldn't stop him, can we let it stop us? Don't let your fear of failure get in your way of pursuing Jesus and pursuing the mission that he called us to and equipped us for. Do not let the fear of failure get in your way. We don't let it stop us in other parts of our lives that can't stop us here and now with the most important thing that we're called to. Do not let your fear get in your way. Guys, as we're coming to a close tonight, I, I recognize that that fear is a real thing. Uh, I've been fighting against it since I've put Christ on in baptism. Uh, even with all the training and school that I have, it's still something that I face. And, and I recognize that that might not be the thing that you're struggling with in your life. If you need encouragement from the church, help push forward in your walk and to correct that, we're here to wrap our arms around you and love you. And if you've been studying about Jesus, about the power that he has, and that he is the Son of God, and you're ready to join him in baptism, the water is ready, and we'll get you in there as soon as possible. If you need anything from the church right now, please come as we stand and as we sing. take up it this morning. If you would, make your way down to the front. If you prefer, you can be served at your seat. Just ask if you would raise your hand.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come to this place, gather around this thy table, break this bread, which for the Christian represents the body that was broken on that cross. May those that partake of it do so in a way and a manner. Be well pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In like manner, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which to the Christian represents the blood that was shed on that cross. May those that partake of it do so in a way and a manner be well pleasing to thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll stand, we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here tonight and sing these songs and offer our prayers to you. And we're especially thankful for this time of study that we've had, and we're thankful for Eli and for reminding us of of how we all can do as this blind man did uh, to just to go and share what Jesus has done for us. Help us to have the courage to do that no matter what the circumstances may be. As we go forward into this week, please go with us and keep us always safe in your loving care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.